our uh, interviewee today is uh, William Toy of Fort City and Catanning. Uh, my name is Connie Rufner. I'm going to be the interviewer. And Mr. Toy, thank you for doing this for us. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, so, when were you born? April 1, 1929. Okay. And where were you born at? Catanning, Pennsylvania. In Catanning. Okay. Um, I said you were Catanning and Ford City. You have a business in Ford City as well? Right, in a branch in Catanning. And how long have you been in business? Since November 7th, 1950. And you remember the Great Depression and um, the 40s as well? I very well do. Good, great. Okay. Um, so tell me a little bit, what do you remember about the Depression? What just sticks in your mind right off the top of your head? Right off the top of my <laughs> mind is uh, my mother and father struggling to keep the family together and uh, worrying about being able to pay their mortgage, of which at that time the government had a uh, an assistance program for people that were in trouble with mortgages. And uh, it was tough times. The family was very closely knit. And uh, in many respects, I think it was a bad situation, but a good one. I think I learned many things from the Depression, uh, meaning the value of money was one of them. My parents never purchased anything unless they could either pay for it or be sure they were able to pay for it. Certainly it's a different society today with credit cards. And uh, I always said my mother was able to make a feast out of literally nothing because of the Depression years. And, uh, You'd done almost anything you could to make a dollar. And it, that was primarily in the 30s. That started to change around about 1940. What did your dad do? My father? Mm -hmm. He was a steel worker. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Worked till the getting eleven in in Leesburg. But he didn't get that job until in the 40s. So he had a number of years there that was very lean and done any kind of work he could do to make some money, paint houses and things like that. So at a very young age, I was a paper boy, <laughs> would do most anything to make a few dollars, shovel snow and whatever. Did you have a garden? Oh yes. Yeah. We had a garden. And those are some of the things that I learned from the Depression, but I do remember the 30s quite well. Where did, when, where did you live in the 30s? Wilson Avenue in Catanic. And, uh, I remember uh, Pearl Harbor Day. I was like 12 years old then. I was ready had a paper route. But uh, <clears throat> then you didn't have communications like today. Primarily the newspaper was a big source of news. And so on Pearl Harbor Day, the newspaper always had specials for events like that. And I can remember at the very end of the Catanning Bridge, I sold newspapers, special, special, read all about it. <laughs> I was only 12 at the time, because that was 1941. How did you know to come and get the special edition? Did they call you? Uh, yeah, the later times would uh, notify you. And, uh, all big events then they had a special publication because other than the newspaper, the source of communication really was the radio. And the 
news coverage. We really depended on a newspaper at that time. So how old were you on Pearl Harbor Day? Twelve. So did you wind up going to the war or were you too young by the time it ended? Too young, just missed it. Do you remember when President Roosevelt died? Oh, very well. My father was a very staunch Democrat. Why? Because, I mean, I guess like millions of other people, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president, they had hopes for something better. And so I remember that very well. When he died, but I remember when he was elected also. Do you? Oh, yeah. What was that like? Hmm? What was that like? Well, in our household that was jubilation because it was hopes for something better, okay? And uh, I always felt and still do that really what ended the Depression was World War II. It's, and I say World War II because certainly with what Hitler was doing in the 30s, uh, as a nation, we began to prepare before World War II. Uh -huh. And uh, the whole country got behind it. And I wonder if we had a conflict like that today, if people would ever rally behind it like they did in World War II. So people were expecting World War II? Were they expecting it to happen? I think they were from the standpoint that, uh, I mean, I, I'm sure the government was because Hitler just kept conquering in Europe, in Europe and, uh, you know, there was already palming England and what have you, so it became obvious that something was going to happen, even though Pearl Harbor was totally unexpected, but I think the, overall the government knew there was a conflict coming, started to prepare for it. Do you remember D-Day? Oh yes, 1945. Sure I do. A lot of jubilation then. And uh, being the age I was, I had friends that were in the service, a couple years older than me, and they started to come home, what have you. So I remember D-Day. I think everybody was very jubilant that it was all over. So it wasn't quite over yet, though. It, no, because shortly after that, the uh, Korean conflict was an excellent, and that was only like five years after D-Day, four years and a half. So you had, so you said you had friends who were over there. Yeah. Did they talk about it when they came back? Some of them did. Some of them didn't. Uh, yeah, a lot of stories, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had uh, one relation here in Fort City, Carl Burdett. He was on a death march. Oh my. Yeah, and there was, um, I think, a couple of other ones in this area that was on that march. And he survived, you know, so it's interesting talking to him. Uh, telling that on the death march that one reason he thinks he made it and didn't get killed off that he kept moving forward in the, in the line and the ones that were tailing behind on the end if you shoot them, okay? Wow. Yeah. Horrible thing, war. Yeah. Did, did you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, I have one brother. He um, was business manager at uh, Torrance State Hospital. And I have four sisters. And my one sister is 88, be 89, is still alive, good health yet. I'm 84, I was second in the family. And then my brother's five years younger than me. So there were six of us all told. A lot of children in a depression. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Did you have chickens and, and a cow or anything like that? Nothing like just that. Just a really garden? Didn't mm -hmm. it's just a garden, and the reason there was a garden, you could uh, rent a garden plot on a farm on a hillside from Catanning, and that's where we had the garden. Oh. And we had wonderful neighbors then, you know, it seemed so different then than today. Uh, you know, everybody on a block this way and everybody a block this way. Today, I don't know my next door neighbor. <laughs> it's just different. Yeah, it is. People, uh, people have been telling us how much their neighbors helped out and they helped them. Yeah. Definitely, and uh, you know, I had the relations in the family. Uh, it was a different world. They were more tightly knit, okay? And uh, very different today. So, what kind of things did you do together with your neighbors? What? What kind of things did you do with your neighbors? Well, we, we had picnics. Remember that very well. And uh, I was in the high school band. I remember very well the instrument that my parent bought me, which is a trumpet. Cost $30. That's a lot of money back then. Paid for it five dollars at a time. And my parents were so proud of me. <laughs> And I have it to this day. Do you? And you couldn't buy it for all the money in the world. Oh, no. Because there's no more money like that. Yeah. There is no more money like that. Yeah. I mean, that was a real sacrifice. But, uh, you know, yeah. I think you had a, a much different bond in with your parents than most children have today, okay? It's, it's just different. And we had, I had very good parents. I think that's part of a good foundation for life. So many children don't have that mm -hmm. and get into all kinds of problems. Man, my parents were strict. My father was a nice guy, but black was black and white was white. And don't lie to me because you know right now, you learn early on. Don't lie, you don't need to get yourself into more trouble. Yeah. You get discipline. I got some lickings. <laughs> what did you do that was bad? Well, I had a sister, she would pick on me. And invariably on Sunday I would get in trouble with her. And of course I was always wrong. I get put in the basement. <laughs> Locked in the basement. I often laugh about that because at that time food was rational. You had food stamps. And pineapple was a lot of food stamp points or however it was rationed. And sometimes when I was in the basement and those cans would be stored there, I would have some pineapple. <laughs> <laughs> They were bad years financially, and people struggled. But on the other hand, uh, there was a lot of good things about it I don't think that exist today. You know, I I sell custom drapery. I get in a lot of homes. And you go into a home where two full rooms of toys, okay? Christmas time, I got one gift. Maybe a little car with a battery in it. I had little lights on it. It was just wonderful, okay? And I think to myself, that meant more to me than what them two rooms mean to any kid today. It's a different world. At least as I view it, okay? Yeah. What kind of games did you play when you were young? Pick up sticks <laughs> and Monopoly. And uh, that's a couple I just think of real quick. And uh, there were other boys in the neighborhood my age, and we played together. 
But uh, at a very young age, I started uh, doing things to earn money, okay? Uh, with quite an ego. I was only 21 when I got in business for myself. And it's a long story how that come about. But some of it come about uh, because I started when I was about 13 years old in a small dry cleaning plant up in Ore Avenue in Catania. And six months, a year later, I got in a bigger plant, the Follis Cleaners in Catania at that time. I remember I'm already now in high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a man that worked there. Well, first of all, they had a Jewish man that owned the place. But he was literally helpless as far as doing anything, so to speak. And he had a man there that he depended on quite highly, and he would go drinking. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't show up for work. So little by little, he depended more on Billy and me. <laughs> and I began learning a trade. And at that time, this Jewish fellow died and another man came in. And boy, he lived in Pittsburgh, had his plan, lives very well. Oh, fancy cars, what I am. So, uh, and I'm learning this industry. So by the time I got out of high school, I had saved enough of money from working there to, and I say working there, I went there at 6, 6.30 in the morning, 8 o'clock, leave there to go to school, get out of school, go there and be there to maybe six, seven o'clock at night. Probably done that in my sophomore, junior, senior high school. But my mind was made up for I got out of high school. This is what I'm going to pursue because this guy became, he was a nice guy, but was, i seen how well he is. And, off and uh, realize that, you know, if you are going to accomplish something in life, you have to make it happen, okay? And uh, I had to dress well. You know, today I <laughs> see all these jeans, and when I went to school they were called overalls, and the only person who wore overalls and tennis shoes was the poorest of the poor. Well, not me. I work hard and I wore suits, brother. I earned it, but to me this was important. So I, when I got out of high school, I went to the National Institute of Dry Cleaning. Graduated from there, back to the Fallis plant. And by now I'm about 19, 20 years old. And uh, met my wife. Her father was in business, and he financed me getting started in my business. And I was only 21 years when I we opened, November 7th, uh, 1950. We were only there about three months, and this is a big operation already, a new building, all new equipment. And debt to here, of course, because in a new business, you only put in as much capital as necessary to get it started. Two and a half, three months down the road, I get called to the draft for the Korean conflict. <laughs> I have a father-in-law that actually signed on to this debt so I could get started. He knows nothing about this business. And called for the draft. So I went for the examination and I got turned down. What did I get turned down on? 
I had it when I was 10 years old, a Brody's abscess, which is unheard of today, but at that time, abscesses, there was no antibiotics, it was a serious thing. And it was in my ankle. So the day I went for that examination, I played that up big time. And that's my only hope. <laughs> and fortunately enough, I'll never forget, the doctor turned me down. And it was a rainy day. And you went to Pittsburgh to do that, and on the second floor of this building, we're on an elevator coming down. And the doctor that made that decision was on that elevator. And I remarked to him, I said, gee, what a gloomy day it was. And he said, young man, for you it's a good day. <laughs> so that relieved me and a lot of other people because, boy, what a predicament that would have been. So that's the story of my getting into business. And, uh, that was a struggle for a lot of years, too. I mean, you had a tremendous amount of debt to pay off. But to give you some idea about today's economy and then, at that time we got a dollar to clean and press a suit. Like 49 cents for a pair of trousers. Today, for that same suit, we get $11 to clean. $5.50 to do that pair of trousers. And Today, you couldn't exist if you had to pay off the kind of debt that I was able to pay off for doing that suit for a dollar. That's the difference in the economy and the value of money today. Okay. And I think we were in business for 20 years, from 50 to 70. 70, I got into the custom drapery business, and um, I think in 1984-85, we got into the sail cleaning business, which is a company called Sail Care, and we market that, of course, nationwide. That's a very uh, interesting business because in Ford City we're dry locked, okay? There's no lakes, nothing. Well, you got Marine Lake, but that doesn't support a business like this. Mm -hmm. So we do that nationwide. And you couldn't do 30 years ago what we do there now. Why do I say that? First of all, you can't ship anything unless it's prepaid. You can't chase somebody in California. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so credit cards, 99% of it is paid for with credit cards without FedEx and UPS to bring it in, it couldn't exist. Uh, very interesting business. Uh, we renovate cells, do modifications on them. We have here, I think it's seven or eight people doing nothing but sewing on sales because 85% of the sales are come in addition to need clean need repair work. You can sail a boat with a dirty sail, but when it needs repair work, you got to do something about it. Uh, and that, I think we have about 15 employees at Sail Care here in Fort City. And then we also got into the linen business. It all comes out of Pittsburgh, and that's people that cater affairs. We don't do that. We only process the linens they use. We first started in the linen business. The primarily was white and iris. Today it's everything in color in the rainbow and fancy configurations like you want to believe. Uh, it's a niche in that market. People used to think if they lived here, boy, you get something done in Pittsburgh. Right? It's the other way around. Pittsburgh doesn't have a plant like I have in Fort City. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me run something by them. In doing fancy linens, they are mostly all circular cloth. Anything 
circular is cut on the bias. Okay. So commercial laundries finish primarily rectangular cloths that they can run through flat work iron. Flat work ironers are huge like small mangler used to be on that front. We finish them here on 120 inch presses. Now in running them through a flat work ironer if they are on the bias you get wrinkles because that goes through it goes catty ones. So we got a superior job and a superior product. So it's a niche in the market. John Doe brought away can't say, oh, I'll do it for you cheaper. He can't compete with what we do. And we have in that department here in Ford City about 10 people work on nothing but linen. We make two trips a day to Pittsburgh, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. So it's interesting in Ford City that we have that kind of a setup. And fortunately for us, because if we wouldn't be diversified, an organization like ours in Ford City couldn't exist. Okay. So between all those things we do, we have a, a good going business in Ford City. And the employee total is thirty some people between the dry cleaning plant, the laundry and the sale business. So that's pretty much uh, the story of <laughs> what I do and where I come from and how I get started. Thank you very much. That is very interesting.